Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Okay. Thank you very, very much, Gabriel. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, and, and, um, and present today on the research that we did at Forrester Research on e-commerce in Latin America. Just a question, how many in the room know Forrester Research? Wow, a good, a good okay. A, I would say about 60, 70% raised their hands. That's really good. Um, you may know then that this is our mission. So we're a market research firm. We're based in the United States, but we have a global footprint. And we work with business and technology leaders to develop customer-obsessed strategies that drive growth. The important piece of this is customer obsession. We focus all of our research on the business strategies and the technologies that you need in your role as an e-business professional or a marketer or an IT professional in order to develop your business around that customer. Okay? Part of that, um, obviously, I'm a little biased, but I work on the team that writes research for the e-business professional, the e-commerce professional. Um, e-commerce is an, a critical piece of customer obsession because the internet has absolutely transformed the way that we interact with businesses, the way we get our information um, forever. So today, I'm really excited to be talking about e-commerce in Latin America. Um, I will present a few general sort of overarching trends, then I'll go into the, a closer look at the three largest markets, right? Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. And then I won't leave the stage without giving you a few key takeaways, um, what you can do when you get back to your desk uh, later this week. So first, an overview. E-commerce in Latin America is part of a larger global trend. In every market that Forrester forecasts, e-commerce is growing. You can see that e-commerce in Latin America is growing at an 8.3% compound annual growth rate between 2015 and 2020. Now that's, a, that's probably um, a little bit under what you've heard in the past few years. It's absolutely um, a deceleration of growth than what we've seen. And it's because Brazil is a massive market in the region. It is critically important um, and makes up um, a large share of the overall revenues. And the economic situation um, has, in, in Brazil has absol absolutely impacted the region's growth as a whole. We'll get into that in more detail. But there are promising uh, characteristics about the markets in Latin America and things that are, that are um, exciting to us about the prospect of e-commerce and the outlook for e-commerce in the next few years. What are some of those things? First of all, the population is relatively young in Latin America. So you can see um, that in Argentina and in Brazil, the average age of a, of a person in, in, these, in these countries is 31. Um, it goes, uh, you know, compare that to the US and to China where you're in the upper 30s and then even into Japan and the UK where it's upwards of 40. The reason that this is important is because young, the younger population is generally more digital, right? So they lay the groundwork for the e-commerce uh, to flourish. But also when they enter the workforce, they spend their newfound wealth online, typically. So we're really excited about the populations, the young populations in Latin America and what it means for the future of e-commerce in these markets. Another very interesting and important fact about uh, Latin America as a region is that the middle class has grown significantly, specifically in the early 2000s. Most of, the, most of this um, growth has been in Brazil in particular. Um, and, and, but the rest of the region has, has also benefited, benefited from reduced poverty rates right, and increased middle class. The reason that this is important is because when, the middle class, when, when individuals lift out of poverty, when the population lifts out of poverty, um, consumer spending increases. That's online and offline. So that's really promising. And an interesting point, too, is that in Latin America, the GDP per capita uh, in most markets are actually much higher than what they are in large markets in Asia Pacific, for example. 
So you have the markets, um, you know, Brazil and Argentina and Mexico ranging in their GDP per capita from 15 to $25,000. Um, in China, it's 14. In India, it's $6,000 per capita. So you can see that there is um, uh, uh, how this plays into the, the economic health and the, and the, um, the uh, as a signal for the positive uh, opportunity for e-commerce in the market. The other thing that's important to, to note the, is that there is a significant online buyer growth potential in Latin America as compared to the rest of the globe. So these circles represent the total online population. This is Forrester data. The blue is the t percent of the online population that has made an online purchase. The orange is the total online population that has not made an online purchase. You can see that Latin America has significant growth potential there. It's an exciting, um, an, an exciting way to look at the markets. Now, the, speaking of the, the growth trajectory and the evolution of an online shopper, Forrester uses this framework to understand any e-commerce market across the globe. So we use this to understand all of the markets in Latin America and Asia Pacific and, and Europe and, and our own in the, in, in the US. Um, it every e-commerce market across the globe evolves in four phases. Phase one, consumers go online. Today it's usually social networking, right? To connect with their, their uh, peers, to entertain themselves. Um, but they're really, you know, they don't trust the online channel to put, to do financial transactions or put their personal financial information online. Phase two, e-business basics. This is when it's usually um, online banking or travel when um, customers start to transact with these large established brand names. That's really important here. Online banks and and or banks and travel companies tend to be large trusted brand names that um, give customers the confidence to start transacting. The other piece here that is very important is that when you think of a travel uh, product, a ticket, it's a digital good. It's low risk when you don't have to worry about whether that package will arrive on time, if it will arrive at all, etc. The phase three, this is when consumers are really relying on the online channel to do research um, and buying what we call you know, medium risk goods. These are easily comparable goods, things that don't change very much merchant to merchant, um, consumer electronics, computer hardware, software, things like that. Um, and then phase four. Finally, this is when consumers feel comfortable and use the online channel to purchase um, categories that are more touch and feel, apparel, footwear, things that have a more sensual quality to them. Um, th they only feel comfortable doing that as a tenured, uh, comfortable online uh, shoppers. So what's interesting here is the importance of trusted brands, right, to, to get consumers to buy online. What I think is, is unique and interesting um, or, or notable for Latin America is that traditional retailers retailers that have had offline presences, stores, brick and mortar stores for decades, embraced the e-commerce channel early on. And they play a key role in driving that e-commerce forward. Contrast that to some markets um, in, in Asia Pacific, for example, web only re online retailers dominate the landscape in those markets, right? Um, so this is really notable. For, uh, for Latin America, and you'll see those traditional retailers really push those advanced omni-channel capabilities forward in Latin America. One other point to contrast uh, Latin America from perhaps other global markets and other regions in the world is that mobile commerce hasn't taken off here uh, as, as it has in, in some other markets. That gives us a little bit of a sad face. Um, but but you know, why is that? Well, we, we look at uh, data like smartphone penetration, right? And actually, Latin America does really well there. Um, we've got 52% of the population in Brazil is a smartphone user, 50% uh, in, in Argentina, 40% in Mexico. Uh, and yet, retailers are still reporting 
less than 10% of their total online revenues are coming through mobile. Uh, so that, that's really interesting. One of the reasons, um, uh, well, I, say, I should say, to compare that, to give that a point of comparison, if you look at markets in Asia Pacific, you know, China and India, for example, online retailers are reporting 30, 40, 50, or more percent of their online revenues coming through mobile, with smartphone penetration being much, much lower, right? In India, only 17% of the population is using a smartphone today. Um, so what, but what that means and what, how we uh, um, really use this information to analyze the market in Latin America is that internet, uh, internet access, broadband access, is actually very, very good um, in Latin Amer America generally. And so, um, as opposed to those markets in Asia Pacific. So consumers in Latin America, mobile, for consumers in Latin America, mobile is not the only channel through which they have digital access. They don't have to rely on their mobile alone. They have the desktop, they have their PC um, and laptop. So that's part of the reason why mobile commerce just hasn't taken off like it has in other markets. So before the, I jump forward, um, to go into each of the markets in detail, I want to give you a sense and a snapshot of the three largest markets. Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. You can see Brazil's online sales are nearly double those for Mexico and Argentina combined. Right, that gives you a sense of scale and the importance of the online retail market in Brazil and why, as I mentioned earlier, when it struggles, the region struggles. We'll get into these numbers a little bit uh, later on. The other thing I want to, uh, to share with you today and what I think is important to note is that online retail sales are still a small percentage of the total retail sales. So you can see in Argentina, it, we've reached you know, upwards of 4%. In Brazil, it's about 2.5%. And in Mexico, online retail sales are still less than 1% of the total retail market. As a point of comparison in the US, we've reached 10%. Um, E-commerce represents 10% of the total retail market in the U.S. Um, and we reached about 5% in 2008, okay, to give you a sense of scale. So now, moving forward, let's take a look at the, at the three largest markets in the region. First, Brazil. Can, who in here is, from, is, is an online retailer operating in Brazil? I imagine a vast majority. All right, not, not as many as I actually thought. That's, that's good. Um, I think these are the numbers that you're here for, right? So Brazil's e-commerce market um, is, will continue to grow. Today, it represents $13.1 billion. These are represented in dollars. Um, and it will grow to about $18 billion by 2020. You could see a little dip there in 2016, um, right there. That's only because these are represented in dollars, right? And because of the currency fluctuation. So um, in Hayais, the market is still, is still growing uh, year over year. So this growth represents a 6.5% CAGR, uh, compound annual growth rate. That's significantly lower than we've seen in years past. But again, I think the important note here is that e-commerce is continuing to grow, and it will continue to grow. And in fact, the worst of it will, will end in 2018, according to our data. Okay. Um, we've seen this trend happen across the globe in times of economic instability. In the US, um, in 2008, 2009, omni-channel or multi-channel traditional retailers often saw their e-commerce revenues grow when their offline sales were tanking and the economy was shrinking. So the same trend is set to take place uh, in Brazil. And um, the market is maturing, so you'll see um, re recall the evolution framework that I, that I explained earlier, right? So um, those phase three categories are those consumer electronics, those easily comparable goods. In 2010, those made um, a vast majority, those made up the vast majority of the market, so 65% here. By 2020, they make up a much larger share. So by 2020, they'll make up almost a third of the online retail market. So going from 11% to 32 by 2020. Okay. Um, 
And oh, as a reminder, it, it, that, that, those phase four categories, is, that's the, the phase I'm really talking about. Um, the phase four is that touch and feel, the, the apparel, the footwear, the, the more uh, touch and feel categories, okay? So here is some interesting data about Brazil in particular that, that I think highlights some interesting, you know, unique features of the market. Um, this is data actually from a collaboration between Forrester and our gracious hosts today, e-commerce Brazil. We surveyed about 300 online retailers um, about their KPIs, their key performance indicators, about their team structure, their headcount, their investment priorities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll just share with you a few KPIs today. This comes from a much broader set of data. Site conversion rate, 1.9%. That's actually pretty low. Um, uh, in, in the US, we have conversion rate that's hovered around 3% for the past few years. Um, so we, we uh, think that this is, it's low today. Um, it will continue to rise as e-commerce matures and e-commerce continues to grow. Shopping cart abandonment rate. I actually would take this data with a grain of salt. I think our retailers, our respondents, were being a little optimistic. 43% um, is actually um, much lower than we see in the US. We see it around 56%. Um, and, and really the guide here is if, you're, if you have less than 25% shopping cart abandonment rate, you're doing phenomenally. Um, if, you're, if you have more, you know, 60, 70% shopping cart abandonment rate, you're a little bit more challenged there. It's something to pay attention to. Um, the rest of the data, average order values, average order for repeat customers, all of these are, are also a little bit lower. I mean, we expect that to tick up with time. The thing that I want to point out here um, is the, the uh, repeat customer rate and the percent of repeat customers. Uh, pretty much lower, and I think there's an opportunity to boost that. So um, what we... What this means is really, right, it's the, the customers that you've enticed or who have come back to you. I think the online retailers have the opportunity to focus on retention, customer retention, boost loyalty programs, et cetera, versus customer acquisition. And we'll see as online retailers do that, this number tick up. And finally, returns as a percentage of, of total sales. This is very low, and I think this is pretty accurate. Um, the the online, the, the return rate in the U.S. is around 12%. Um, so what that means for, for uh, online retailers not currently operating in Brazil, but perhaps thinking about it, um, you will have the benefit of this sort of lower return rate than what you're used to. Um, but it sort of heeds as a warning for, for online retailers currently operating in Brazil. This is absolutely going to increase. And especially as that, those phase four um, categories increase their market share. So those apparel, footwear, those more touch and feel categories gain more market share and consumers start buying more of those products. This return rate will absolutely increase. So you prepare yourselves. Um, those of you with very good eyesight or who are paying close attention can see that this data is from 2014. It's a little bit stale, right? Still, still good for guidance, but it could use refreshing. Today, I'm very excited to announce that we are kicking off the refresh of this, of this research. So um, e-commerce Brazil and Forrester are collaborating and launching a new a survey, an updated survey, um, for online retailers operating in Brazil. You will get a, a link to this survey in an email after the event. We would love, love, love your participation here. Um, we are, uh, we will be asking about KPIs, much like the ones that I just presented on, an expanded list of those, your investment priorities, your, uh, the challenges to your e-commerce growth, your team headcount, and um, very excited to also include B2B. Uh, we, will be, we will be including B2B companies in this survey as well. So please help us. We had 300 um, respondents last time. We're hoping to beat that number. Uh, we'd love your participation there. Okay, um, Argentina. So what, um, what has defined or, or been a unique characteristic of Argentina over the past few years and has differentiated it from Brazil and from Mexico has been pretty strict import restrictions. So this has challenged global brands. Um, you'll see the e-commerce landscape is, is dominated by local players. Um, there aren't too many international players uh, uh, dominating the e-commerce e landscape as of yet, um, unless they have local 
sort of presences already. This is changing, right? The new president, Macri, is, has, has articulated his intention of easing the import restrictions. He's already made a few moves in that direction. Time will tell. Um, but it has, it has absolutely defined the, the landscape um, thus far. Argentina is the second largest e-commerce market in Latin America, right, after Brazil. You can see that the market today is about $4.8 billion, and it will, um, it will reach $7 billion by 2020, representing a compound annual growth rate of 8%, which is a solid, a solid number. Um, again, those early stage categories, um, un, uh, uh, are, are dominating that landscape. So at least 65% of the e-commerce market today is made up of those consumer electronics, easily comparable goods. Um, and I say at least because I actually think we're being very, very generous here in our data on those phase four categories. So that the apparel, the footwear, I think that that um, is actually a very generous estimation of that market today. But you can see that even when we're being very generous to those phase four categories, that the, the um, e-commerce in Argentina is still very much a story of consumer electronics and easily comparable goods. That being said, um, Online retailers uh, or multi-channel, omni-channel retailers are beginning to offer advanced omni-channel offerings. So Falabella, I'm sure we're all familiar with, right? Department store um, operating offline and online in Argentina, in, in Chile, in Colombia, um, and in Peru. You can see here that they offer pretty advanced omni-channel options. Inventory visibility, right? Store inventory visibility is, is made available online. You've got multiple fulfillment options. You can buy online, pick up in store, or you can choose a designated um, uh, point to pick up your purchase. Now, Mexico. So Mexico has, um, has been capturing a lot of the, the sort of headlines, right? Um, it's a small market today. So you can see it's about $3 billion, um, and it's going to double in the next five years. In 2020, it's going to reach $6 million. You can see that the online buyers are also going to more than double in that time frame. Um, and actually, they're going to surpass, the online buyers in Mexico are going to surpass the number of online buyers in Argentina uh, by 2020. So Argentina will have about 18 billion. You'll see Mexico will have 25. The interesting point, when you dig through that a little bit deeper, um, the online spend per buyer, though, so the online spend, the average online spend per buyer in Mexico will still be about half of what it would be for, for um, the average online buyer in Argentina in that time frame. Okay. So it's, but you can see it's one of the faster growing markets in the region, 15% online uh, compound annual growth rate through 2020. And again, now the truly, truly an early stage market, consumer electronics, um, computer hardware, um, digital goods, these are all dominating the landscape today. And again, the caveat that I think we're being we very, very generous for those phase four categories. I would estimate that it's a little bit less than that. Um, but there are other barriers too. So um, in addition, I think one of the more well-documented uh, barriers to e-commerce growth or challenges for, for merchants is the payments landscape. Right, cash-based society still, cash on delivery persisting, cash payments at um, convenience stores, right, the Oxos and 7-Elevens. Um, but another one of the, and that's absolutely very true, another one of the uh, barriers that I think um, is important to talk about is that online retailers in the market really truly have to provide tangible evidence that consumers can trust them and that they can transact with them uh, securely and safely online. Uh, Palacio de Hierro, I think, does a good job of this, of addressing this by providing an online help um, section. Now, this is, you know, probably illegible for most in the audience, but really, it's a detailed help guide. It has information about fulfillment, returns. Um, it has information about security and privacy. Um, it even has a step-by-step, -step, this is how you shop online guide. Um, 
really goes a long way for establishing that trust with the relate with the with the consumers, um, and and I think addressing that barrier to to um, e-commerce. Now, all of the opportunities and, and exciting characteristics that I mentioned before about young populations and middle class, um, internet penetration, uh, smartphone penetration, all of these things that we look at when we, we try to sort of gauge the e-commerce op e opportunity in a market, Mexico has it. Um, and it's growing, as I mentioned, at a 15% annual growth rate. It has captured the attention of international brands, in particular some US brands. Um, Amazon famously launched last year um, they launched with a full product catalog, um, kind of a unique offering for them. It's, you know, um, compared to their offering in Brazil, where they've limited their selection to books and Kindle. Um, and in Mexico, they've, they've extended the full product, product catalog. Walmart, um, e-commerce leader in the market for sure. Lowe's and Home Depot have been battling it out for a few years there in Mexico. And Williams-Sonoma actually had a really interesting model where they partnered with an offline and online, a traditional retailer, Liverpool. Um, uh, they had sort of a store within a store on the Liverpool online uh, experience and then have launched offline, partnering with Liverpool. So using the online channel as a sort of test and learn model. Um, and they have Liverpool run franchised Williams Sonoma stores in Mexico today. So it's really exciting opportunity. We're keeping our eye on Mexico. We see the growth potential, but we you know it's still a very, a very small market today. So key takeaways. Um, what are the key takeaways? If you had to remember one thing about what I've said about each of the markets that we've gone through, despite the economic crisis, e-commerce in Brazil is going to grow. Rest assured, e-commerce will grow, right? We've seen that with, um, with Magazine Luisa publicly stated their, their growth numbers at the end of last year. The overall sales shrunk, right? I think it was 8%. Um, their Q4 e-commerce uh, sales jumped 19%, all right? Um, so this is, we'll, we'll continue to see this trend in Brazil going forward. In Argentina, um, should the import restrictions ease up, uh, we will see more e-commerce growth, and e-commerce will continue to grow as the economic situation also improves. Um, but as those import restrictions uh, ease up, you'll also see more international competition. I think um, it's been a wait and see market for a lot of international brands. And as soon as those import restrictions ease up, you're gonna see more international players ta um, targeting the market. And Mexico, e-commerce in Mexico is set to grow significantly in the years to come. It's absolutely a market to, to keep an eye on. So what does this mean to you? Even if you're not operating in those markets, perhaps you're operating in another market in Latin America or across the globe, what are some best practices to inform your e-commerce offering? Well, the first thing I, I think is to use that framework that I went through earlier, right? The e evolution of e-commerce markets. Understand where in that evolution that market that you're interested in, in operating in, where in that maturity um, uh, phase it is, it is in, it's currently operating. What, op, what um, product categories have shifted online and inform your offering that way? Um, you know, if you're going into an early stage market, you may be able to carve out, if you're, a, say, a phase four retailer, a fashion retailer, an apparel retailer, you may be able to carve out a space for yourself early on. Maybe it's, you know, consumers aren't buying uh, that category yet with much frequency, but um, you want to get in early, but you use that maturity information to understand the longer sort of return on investment that you may have in that market. And again, in those earlier stage markets, don't ignore your role as a retailer in educating and helping along the consumers. Um, establish a level of trust with those consumers um, in those early stage markets. Doing an online help guide is one way to do it. Um, really look at their, their concerns. Is it fulfillment? Uh, usually the concerns are around fulfillment, uh, returns, payment security, um, uh, and, and sometimes the how do I actually do this? So giving them the information that they need and, and establishing that trust level early on. And, and in more mature markets, um, you may need to be offering really key e-commerce features to compete. Um, and, and meet customer expectations. So this may be more advanced omni-channel options like I mentioned before about leveraging store, um, your, you know, enterprise inventory information 
and making that visible online, uh, requiring a lot of sort of systems integration to make that happen. Could be omni-channel fulfillment, the buy online, pick up in store. It could even be visual site features, right? Maybe it's video, product video. Maybe it is um, uh, ratings and reviews or, or other online sort of site features, okay? Now, of an, a special, I was doing the laser, okay. A special, you know, my advice for online retailers operating in Brazil. It is a, it is a, it is a time of, of um, hardship, I would say. You know, we're, we're not downplaying that. Uh, consumers will absolutely be more price sensitive. They're not secure in their financial future and the impact um, that this will have on their, on their financial security. But they will use the online channel. It is exactly because of that that they will use the online channel to inform their purchases and make sure that they feel comfortable that they're getting a good deal, right? So the value and convenience of the online channel will still draw shoppers. Now that being said, you have to have the site features, <coughs> excuse me, to um, to serve those customers well. So you know, ensure that you have um, easy and streamlined navigation to the discounted products, the sales section. Perhaps there's some sorting by price. Um, uh, and, and linked to the next point here, make sure that you're really explicit about how you're helping customers save money. So even if you have a premium product, you may articulate the, uh, the value for money um, aspect in your, in your sort of marketing copy or in your, your online content. You know, here you're, you're paying more, you know, here's this premium product, but look how much we're saving you in the long run if you buy this product, that sort of thing. And then finally, and I mentioned this already, turn your attention to customer retention. So I'm not saying abandon all customer acquisition tactics, but what we're saying is um, ramp up, maybe reallocate some of those funds toward developing some a retention program. Perhaps it's a loyalty program. Maybe it is special uh, promotions or discounts or services um, uh, for to incent those customers to come back and re and, and turn into repeat customers of yours. Okay. The end. Thank you very, very much. I think we're going to open it up for questions now.